Welcome to the first event in the Turtle Island Reads event of 2019. As he said, I'm Rosanna Deerchild. I'm the host of Unreserved, the radio space on CBC for Indigenous uh, community culture and conversation. I'm so happy to be here. It's nice to see your blurry faces. <laughs> I know you're out there, though. And uh, I'll be your host tonight for this panel-led discussion for the third edition of Turtle Island Reads, a celebration of storytelling that highlights the importance of stories written by and about Indigenous peoples of Canada. Right now, uh, as I said, we are here for a panel-led discussion with you, our audience, uh, presented by CBC Montreal in partnership with the John Abbott College Media Arts Department and Indigenous Studies Certificate. Our goal today, this evening, is to look at the way stories by and about uh, Indigenous people in Canada are told in the media. That could include journalism, it could include film, and any other digital or analog platform. And it's a chance to talk about what journalists, filmmakers, and other media professionals are getting right, what they are getting wrong, and what needs to change. This one-hour event is being broadcast live on CBC Montreal Facebook. Hello, Facebookians, wherever you are. Uh, and CBC Indigenous Facebook. So if you are part of our online audience, go ahead and write in to share a comment or question. And my handy technology here just died on me. So <laughs> I'm sure somebody will talk to me in my head with all the other personalities in there. Um, and if you are part of our live audience here in the theater, know that we will leave some time at the end for your very thoughtful questions. Um, and so we look forward to those questions. So let's meet our fantastic panelists. Besides the fact that all the women are wearing bead bling and pointy <laughs> shoes, Greg's going to be our, 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 like our road manager guy if we start a girl group. Um, <laughs> Michelle Smith is a Dawson professor in cinema communications, a filmmaker, coordinator at Dawson College Transition Program for Indigenous Students and Journeys. Greg Horn is an Indigenous storyteller and editor for uh, Yerdi Wazi. Yerdi was it. Yerdi was it. Uh, Gatawagi Weekly Print and Online Newspaper. Brittany Laborn way over there, is an actor and writer and production coordinator at Resolution Pictures, an Aboriginal-owned film and television production company based in Montreal. She's best known as an actor for her role in the APTN dramedy Mohawk Girls. And Jessica Deer is a Montreal-based reporter editor at CBC Indigenous. Let's give our panelists a round of applause and welcome them. <laughs> A little connection here, as uh, we all like to say, we are related in some way. Uh, Michelle and Brittany both have a John Abbott connection. Michelle was a professor here before she moved to Dawson, and Brittany graduated from John Abbott College, acting in student productions in this very theater. Yes, I yeah. did. <laughs> Great to be back. <laughs> Great to be back. Great to have you. Great to have everybody here. And uh, Greg, Brittany, and Jessica all share the same home community of Ganawage, which is Bo, east of here across the St. Lawrence River, 30 clicks or so. Um, let's get to the first part of our panel discussion. We've got so much that we want to jam in here and uh, get conversation going because conversation leads to change. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about the challenges, but let's talk a little bit first about what media does right. Um, what is working when the mainstream media tells our stories and tries to reflect the realities of Indigenous people in Canada? And since, Jessica, you're the journalist, we're going to start with you. Um, what does mainstream media get right when they tell our stories? Well, I think, first off, it's just, it's really positive to see that there's an appetite for Indigenous stories. Um, and I see that, well, for example, this event and making space for Indigenous voices, whether it's in stories or in newsrooms. Mm. Um, I'm thinking about, obviously, um, CBC Indigenous and how uh, our unit was created to, to um, ignite uh, inform conversations mm -hmm. through uh, original community-based uh, journalism that really show the diversity of in Indigenous experiences and perspectives, and that's something um, po a positive that we're seeing at the CBC and mm -hmm. uh, hopefully more places. 
you said something interesting there. You said community-based journalism. What does that mean to you? Telling stories that are <laughs> really at the heart in communities, in ind indigenous communities. Obviously, I'm, I'm from Kahnawake, so a lot of my stories are, are, are based from my community. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been in the journalism business? <laughs> I started uh, just over 10 years ago uh, at the Eastern Door. Greg actually hired me. It was my first journalism job. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been at the CBC since June. Mm -hmm. And how many um, Indigenous journalists are in your newsroom? There's two of us. Do you feel that there should be more? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I, ideally, I would like to see indigenous, an Indigenous journalist in every newsroom. Mm. Um, and then the ones that where there's more, more than one, just to see that grow over the years. There is a, uh, quite an ongoing debate, a conversation going on across Canada about who should be telling our stories. Who do you think should be telling our stories? <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's a tough question because it's not, it's not impossible for non-Indigenous people to tell our stories in a proper and good way, but I think a lot of Indigenous journalists just have that context and that background. Um, that there's less of a learning curve uh, where we know, where we know that, that background to, to tell a story and to give that story justice of what it deserves. Mm -hmm. Um, let's go over to Brittany. You're an Indigenous actor and creator. You were one of the stars, as we said, of Mohawk Girls on APTN. And you work uh, behind the camera, in front of the camera, beside the camera. Yeah, all I work on all camera. sides. All <laughs> um, no, definitely, well, uh, you know, my work in front of the camera is a little bit more obvious, but I also do behind the scenes um, jobs as well. I've worked as a director, a production coordinator. I will be, I have my first writing gig this year that I'm pretty excited about. Um, uh, for TV, so yeah, kind of getting getting to know uh, every department, um, and I just kind of want to touch on what you said about who who do you think should be telling our stories. I think I totally agree with Jessica when it comes to media journalism. Like she said, it's completely possible for non-Indigenous uh, journalists to cover Indigenous issues in, in, a, in a really respectful way. I mean, we have some mutual friends, I think, who are not Indigenous and really care about Indigenous issues and um, really do them justice in, 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 um, in covering them. But when it comes to film and television, um, it's kind of a different story. I really think that if there are, if it's an Indigenous story or if there are Indigenous characters, I mean, there, there absolutely should be somebody involved who is Indigenous, who, who, mm. can, who can offer insight and their perspective and um, and I think we're, we're going in that direction. I think for a long time we, we, we weren't, but we're, we're going in that direction. More and more we're seeing, we're seeing more Indigenous stories being told, more characters being written into mainstream series or, or films. Um, and they have this, this new uh, piece of documentation that came out that I think, Michelle, I don't know if you wanted to kind of touch on it, that will help people, um, will help, it's kind of a set of guidelines for people to know when approaching Indigenous content, kind of a, 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 a do's and don'ts mm. list, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a screen protocol that was developed over, oh, probably over a year, a year and a half. And there were consultations with Indigenous creators from across Turtle Island. And it's really exciting. It's a set of protocols and guidelines um, about working with community, um, about, um, it has doc um, resources for community members to be able to be better equipped and better informed when, say, a filmmaker comes into the community and wants to do a project. Wow. How do you respond? What kind of things do you need to set up? Um, what do you need to know? What might that creator offer in terms of job opportunities or training opportunities mm -hmm. for your community members? So it's really, really exciting. It just, just came out. So mm -hmm. I think we're going to mm -hmm. hear a lot more about that. Mm -hmm. Really, really valuable. Interesting. Let's take a step back there. Why was that necessary to, to develop something like that? It's because misrepresentation, because people were going into communities who were not familiar with the communities, not familiar with the protocols, wanting to tell Indigenous stories. Mm. And too many people had, uh, you know, had, had faced you know, real problems with that. Lack of respect. People coming in, grabbing a story, and leaving. Um, 
without honoring the community, without going through um, uh, you know, the different protocols who, that are necessary, for instance, meeting with people that are necessary to meet with before you start up a project. Mm -hmm. So it really comes from experience. Um, and historically, I mean, our stories have been told by outsiders and that's continued to shape how not only others see us, but how we see ourselves. So there's really been a move um, from Indigenous creators to really change that relationship. And how are you making it accessible to people that need to see that? That document? Yeah. It's online. Huh? Yeah, it's online. It was um, commissioned by Imaginative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it just, uh, it literally came out maybe, oh, like weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And that's called what? Um, it's screen, uh, screen Protocols and Pathways. And there's a subtitle as well, but um, Alanisa Bomswim has been involved, uh, Jesse Wente, uh, a number of uh, Indigenous filmmakers. Brittany and I were part of a consultation Yeah, they, they actually went across the country yeah. and consulted with Indigenous people in every area, uh, almost all the provinces, yeah. um, major cities, and got input from everybody in mm. what should be in this mm. document. Like, what... What do we need to touch on? What do people need to know when approaching? And not just, you know, not just, I mean, it kind of covers everything, like not just the filmmakers, but the communities um, the, d with regard to documentary or fiction, or I mean, it really covers everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it's really exciting. Mm -hmm. Youth voices as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing that I found really interesting there that um, is, is this idea that sometimes maybe a storyteller or an outside storyteller will approach one person within a community, maybe a young person. Mm. Oh, that's a really cool story. Oh, and you know, I work in education, right? So I hear these kinds of situations where a teacher will say, oh, that's a really great story. You should write that story for your essay or for your literature project. And the student will say, well, I don't have authority. I can't share that story. Mm -hmm. According to my cultural protocols or community protocols, I can't share that story. Um, so also in that document, there's, there's um, discussion about um, you know, who, who, who needs to be informed. So that's, say, young people who uh, you mm. know, maybe don't necessarily have that authority or that permission from their elders, for instance, to share that story. So that, that all of those... Um, Pathways are followed. Mm, okay, yeah. let's bring Greg into the into the conversation as you sit over there. Um, you have a very different kind of situation as an independent journalism uh, journalist working in your community of Ganawage. Uh, you're telling your community stories from your community. Uh, so, what advantage do you think that gives you over a, a mainstream uh, media outlet like CBC to tell those stories? Well, um, I mean, it, it's something that I've been doing for probably t past 20 years or so, mm -hmm. uh, working at first at Eastern Door, then at K103, and then, then now with my own publication. Um, you know, and, and it, it, it allows us to, to set the direction and, and, and really look at the types of stories we want to tell. Um, you know, there's a lot of positive stories, a lot of good things that are happening in our community and in our communities, and, and that's kind of where we want to go and, and tell those stories. Um, you know, there's that old adage in journalism, if it, if it bleeds, it leads. Um, you know, that's not always the case. We want to make sure that, uh, you know, the really good things are, are being, being told about, about our communities, and that's really what we, our goal is. Mm. But there's also some disadvantages to being, you know, telling the story of your neighbor when it's yeah. your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, uh, that, that comes with the territory. Um, you know, I mean... Uh, Doing, doing the job that I do, you don't make a lot of friends. Uh, mm. You make more enemies than you make <laughs> friends. Uh, you know, uh, because sometimes you have to tell the difficult stories and uh, have to be un tell the uncomfortable things uh, that are happening. Um, mm. And, you know, in order to, to, to do community journalism in your community, you need to have a, a, a thick skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. <laughs> Amen. Yes, everybody is nodding every, everywhere. Yeah. Um, so that, that takes us right into the next part as to challenges. And one of the challenges you're saying is that just telling those stories, some people get mad. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've said this a few times uh, to people who were not happy with uh, what I've written, uh, is that we only write about people who deserve to be written about, good or bad. Mm. Uh, so... If you don't want to be written about, don't do anything that, that's going to cause <laughs> me to write about you. Uh, you know, it's, it, things like that. You know, it, 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 uh, people ch t change their tune pretty quickly after that. And, uh, you know, 
people have to understand that that we're doing a job, um, you know, and our job is to inform the community is, is with, with as much information as as possible. Mm, it's a fine line. Yes. Uh, let's go to, over to Jessica as a journalist that works at CBC in a mainstream, but you're Indigenous. Um, what are the challenges that you see in representation of our stories, our issues, our realities, and all of this, all of this stuff that you have to juggle? Well, I guess first off, I, I mean, I have such a, of a back background in community journalism, mm -hmm. um, so I understand the struggles that, <laughs> that Greg has experienced. Um, and then coming to the CBC, I, I, even stories, uh, people in my community trusted me to tell uh, while I was working in community journalism, um, that trust isn't necessarily there at, um, when you're working for a mainstream media. So I've had experiences where people I interviewed last year aren't so, are, are a little bit reluctant to, to be interviewed now because it goes to a larger audience and um, mm. just a lot of mistrust towards, towards um, uh, mainstream media. And I mean, I, like, I can understand because there's been years of misrepresentation in, in a lot of media coverage when it comes to Indigenous people. Like you see a lot of um, tragedy, you see a lot of uh, controversy covered, but not those um, those good moments in the community or those those stories that you know uh, show um, our, our, vi our the vibrancy of our communities, the diversity and uh, resilience. Mm. Um, so, can you give me an example of when that happened, where you went from community to mainstream, went to somebody and said, "I want to do this story," and they said, "No, I don't want to." And how did you overcome it? Uh, well, this, sometimes the stories didn't happen, um, and that's been a reality. And you just gotta, <laughs> it's hard to deal with, but uh, other times I, I just have a conversation. And sometimes it's just having that conversation and rebuilding that relationship and that trust that maybe um, the next time they'll be able to, to trust me. And that's, mm -hmm. that's also happened in the, mm -hmm. in the past as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I think there's there's just a lot of a lot of mistrust, and you see that um, it's still happening from certain coverage today, where you see like pan indigenization within within stories or in headlines, um, and I think that just boils down to um, journalists needing to to build better relationships with indigenous communities. Is it frustrating for you though to work in a mainstream and then see pan indigenousness and then if you don't know what that is that means um, there's this idea that all indigenous people are the same kind of group and they have the same sort of spiritual beliefs and they have sort of same cultural beliefs and so on. Is that frustrating for you? Of course. Yeah. But, so how know, do you deal with that? It's just Try to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I yell around. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> fix it by trying to make more friends than enemies. <laughs> Honey, instead of uh, <laughs> vinegar, right? Yeah. Brittany, what about um, in the film industry, in the storytelling industry? What, what is, uh, what's not working there? Well, I mean, I think in Canada in particular, we're really on this on this move toward diversity, you know, which is great, and inclusion, and representation of, of uh, many different ethnic groups, making yeah. sure that that's happening. Um, I mean, as as an actor, uh, I, I you know I ha I see that inside that inside info, the breakdowns you get for every show or film. You see the different characters listed, and you can read the character descriptions, and and so there is definitely. Um, you know, a move towards that, which is great. Um, but I still think that we have a long way to go. Um, you know, for example, uh, there, like I was mentioning before, there are a lot more um, Indigenous stories being told, Indigenous characters being included in mainstream uh, series on major networks like CBC or CTV or Global. Um, but the, 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 the sort of downfall is like they're still sometimes kind of just there because it's like a native character that that is there for a very specific reason you know mm. they're, they're not I mean what I would love to see is is having you know hiring native actors to play any part like just to have them there among 
the other cast, the other characters, and they're not there because they're indigenous, they're there because they're good actors, and there are so many great indigenous actors. There are so many more of us now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and what happens is we, we, you kind of get stuck in this, this stereotype, you know? You, you get stuck in a box, you know? And we want to break out of that box and, mm -hmm. and go beyond that and, and just kind of be included with everyone else. Imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's that. And then the other thing I just wanted to touch on is um, even with regard to funding, you know, we, we, have, we have, there are envelopes of money that are specific to indigenous content. And it's kind of like, that's great, but at what point will we, will we be considered just part of everybody? Like, mm. what, I think there's still this idea that indigenous content doesn't sell or indigenous content or indigenous stories don't matter as much because it's, it's, it's sort of like this subcategory, you know? I, I was just reading an article after the, the Junos recently, how, you know, some of the indigenous musicians, there, there's an indigenous music category. Mm -hmm. And some of them were saying like, when are we just gonna be able to be included in the regular categories? You know, why do we have to fit into this category? Um, and it's sort of similar, you know, in, in, in film. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, I guess, we still have a long way to go to change the way we think, to think that p people don't want to hear these stories. I mean, they're new stories. They're stories that uh, nobody has, has heard of or seen. And I, in, a, in an age where we're just recycling stories, mm -hmm. movies are being remade three, four, five times, uh, you know, the, the superhero movies again and again and a new one in this character. It's like, I mean, you know, I guess those make money or whatever. But, but, uh, but you know, we have this whole pool of untapped, super interesting, amazing stories yeah. that, that can come from, from, from us, from our communities that, that I think everyone will relate to because at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all feel, we all feel the same things and we all experience the same things together. Let me just push back a little there, because earlier you had said um, we should just be an actor, not an Indigenous mm -hmm. actor, and just be considered mm -hmm. that pool of good actors. Mm -hmm. But there are so many Indigenous stories that need to be told, which is something you also just said. Of course. So, is yeah. it one or the other, or is it both? No, I think it's both. Absolutely, it's both. Um, uh, you know... Uh, with indigenous, you know, like I was saying, indigenous stories, we have so many new and interesting stories. Um, and of course, those roles should be played by indigenous actors, obviously. Mm. But at the same time, it, we shouldn't be confined. You know, we shouldn't be... Just telling those stories. Right. We shouldn't have to just fit into that box or only be seen in those roles. I mean, we should be seen everywhere. And I think, I think... I think a big part of the problem too, uh, you know, for people to say, oh, well, indigenous stories don't really sell or people don't want to see that or, it's, or whatever it is. It's like, well, that's kind of part of the problem. You know, I, I feel like a, a lot of Canadians sometimes don't see us as full, real human beings, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think including, you know, indigenous actors just, you know, everywhere within, within Canadian TV and film, I mean, I think that would really do go a long way in humanizing us, yeah. for one, you know, instead of just always showing that same stereotype, you know. Um, I think that would make a huge difference because that is where, let's face it, we get all of our, all of our information these days about, about other people, about other places in the world. Like, that's where we get our information. So, mm -hmm. you know. To people who say that, I always say North of 60, the first uh, yeah. episode of North of 60, 10 million people watch that. Yeah. 10 million Canadians. So yeah. people want, want to watch. People want to hear these stories. They want to know. Michelle, let's go uh, to you. You, have, you see the challenges of representation in the media as being greater in Quebec than the rest of Canada. Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so unfortunate. It's, um, I've lived here for over 20 years now. I go back to Manitoba every year, happy to go back, but this is my home. Mm. And um, I don't know, in a place where somehow teachers think that it's okay to wear dress up headdresses mm. to a primary school in front of children, 
who are learning and soaking things up every day, every moment, where, um, you know, a renowned Quebec playwright creator thinks it's okay to mount a huge production globally with no Indigenous actors. It's a production called Canada about Indigenous issues. Um, where a filmmaker thinks that he can mine um, YouTube for representation of Inuit people, not at their best, mm -hmm. um, and say that he has the right to do that and make a film that is artistic creation and that it's freedom of speech, it's his freedom of speech to do so, that these things are happening here and it kind of seems to happen on a regular basis. These things have all happened within the last year. That tells me that there's something specific that's going on here in Quebec that... What is it that's going on specifically? Well, I mean, I mean, and it's not to say that things are rosy and perfect in the rest of Canada. No, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that has to be done everywhere. But, I, you know, I think it comes down to a couple of things. I think, and, and this is throughout the discourse in Quebec, we hear that that time of contact, colonization in Quebec was not colonization that um, there were friendly relations between Indigenous folks and the settlers. And then that kind of spills over. I mean, you, you know, there's been the struggle for sovereignty and independence in here for, here for quite some time. And, you know, there are some specific historical reasons for that. And people, you know, did suffer discrimination as, as Quebecers vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mainstream or British, you know, Anglo-Saxon population. But how can you have a movement for independence when you're not acknowledging, you know, the, the people who were here before, um, you know, so it's, it's you know, and, and I have also heard that um, Quebecers, uh, French Quebecers sometimes refer to themselves as having been colonized. They're the colonized. So if you're the colonized, what, what does that make you? So there's a lot to unpack. It's a conversation that needs to be had. Uh, you know, publicly at a bigger level, because I see these kinds of this kind of discourse sort of uh, creeping in. Not creeping in; it's it's very present even mm, in education, mm. in media, and and there's sort of that sense that oh, that's not our we we're not the bad ones. We're all indigenous here because there's also that. I didn't see anybody's land. Yeah, exactly. There's also <laughs> that thread in Quebec that oh, we all have indigenous blood, so we're all here together, and there's no victims here. Victims mm -hmm. in quotation marks. Mm -hmm. So it's it's problematic. It's something that that I uh, we need to we really need to address. Um, you know, it's exciting to see, even though you know I, I have some misgivings about the terminology about truth and reconciliation. How can you reconcile when you're not uh, two parties on equal footing? You know, we have these critiques that we hear about reconciliation, but that 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 discussion about truth and reconciliation, I. I I, I think it is it is moving things forward in some ways. It is creating some spaces, but it's a, it's real quiet in Quebec. Mm. Yeah, Greg, you said you've been in the business for twenty plus years, yeah. as have I. Fist bump that day. <laughs> um, where 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 is mainstream media failing? I mean, we went from being dead Indians all the time to being troubled indigenous people all the time to suddenly we're reconciling. What, what, what's going on here well, in your, in I, I your think, view? I think part of the problem with the mainstream media is that they, they tend to mostly tell stories about our communities when something bad is happening. Mm. Uh, and then, then when they're telling the stories, it's about the, the choice of language. Uh, if you go back to, to the summer of 1990, um, one of the things that, that all the mainstream media reported was that the dispute in Ganestage was about uh, Indian burial ground, giving the visual visualization that it's something that's mythical and, mm -hmm. and it might be there. Or when ancient, it, ancient, yeah. long time ago. When in actuality, it, it was the Pine Hill Cemetery, the cemetery that was used by, it, that, and is still being used by that community that was being threatened to be bulldozed. So, you know, so it gives a different imagery and the readers tend to think of it as differently, mm -hmm. as, as if, you know, how, how would the reader feel if there was a project for a golf course expansion on the Mount Royal Cemetery? You know, it, w it would elicit a different reaction. So, so those are, you know, you're going, that's going back almost 30 years uh, about the choice of language, but, but that still rings true today. Um, you know, if, if you're looking at 
um, you know, telling stories, you t- talk to the people that are, that are affected, not just talk at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of times where, where I've gotten phone calls from uh, journalists in the mainstream media just saying, oh, well, what's your view on this? And for, for quotes, and I said, no, 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 no. I said, you don't get to do, get, get off that easily. You have to go and contact people that, that will be affected. It, it, you're taking a, an easy route by, by asking a journalist for an opinion. I said, I, if, if I'm going to write something about Montreal, I'm not going to call you and ask you for a comment about what you think is going on with city politics. I'm going to call City Hall. Yeah. You know, so, so those are some of, the, some of the issues that need to be improved. Mm-hmm. And, and there are journalists uh, in, the, in the mainstream uh, media that are doing doing their doing the a good job and doing things right, uh, and hopefully, by by them leading by example, it it starts to transcend into other areas and into, into all stories. Do you think that if uh, the Oka Rebellion happened today, it would be covered differently? Oh, for sure, um, because. At the time, uh, we didn't have very many of our own media outlets. We didn't have very many of our own journalists. Um, if, if it happened today, um, you would have thousands of storytellers immediately reporting on front lines through Facebook Live and uh, Twitter and, and re- what, social media and whatever, you know. Um, and those images, the, th- the things that were happening that most of the world wasn't seeing in 1990 would see. And, you know, just look at Standing Rock from a couple of years ago. Um, how, many, how many people were, were, went there and took pictures and videos and, and showed the world. Uh, meanwhile, the, the government was, was saying, oh, no, no, everything's fine. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and oh, oh, we're, we're responding to fires. And w- w- when in actuality, the, the sheriff's department was, was attacking uh, protesters with uh, in sub-zero t- uh, temperatures with water cannons, mm-hmm. uh, and, and and those stories got out because of things like social media. So so if if something like 1990 were to happen again, um, it would definitely be covered differently. Mm-hmm. Let's move on to uh, our part three about how do we make change. And I'm going to start with you because um, because I'm here already. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you were in charge of all the media and the mainstream media in the world and how it was covered in Canada in terms of Indigenous people, what would you change? That's a really tough question. Um, I mean, I, th- I think that the first thing that needs to change is that uh, if you're a mainstream media journalist, and you're covering in indigenous issues, you need to, to get to know the people you're covering. Because um, in order to tell a story, uh, you have to gain the trust of the people you're telling, of, of the people whose stories you're telling. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the, one of the major problems with the mainstream media is that people in our communities don't trust the mainstream media. And they don't trust the, trust the mainstream media with our stories. So the, it, it needs to be a two-way street. Um, but if, if, if a journalist is going to, and a mainstream media outlet is going to take the time to get to know the community that they're covering and, and the people in it, it will go a long way in, in changing the narrative, mm-hmm. you know, because then, then it's easier for, for that person to call somebody in, in Ganawage or Ganesadage or, you know, anywhere else and, and say, hey, what's going on? Can you, can you give me some information? And, and, and it becomes something that, that, that. Is, is, is easier to work with. Mm. How do we do that? How do we, uh, how does mainstream media foster that kind of trust? I mean, you, you've got to take, there's certain journals today that are doing it, um, and you just have to, I think they, the, the media outlets themselves have to take the time to invest the time mm-hmm. in, into their journalists who are going to be covering a certain beat mm-hmm. uh, to be able to go into these communities and, and, and maybe not even in, into the communities to tell stories, but just to, uh, to, and to get a story, but just to go and, and to introduce themselves and to, to start working with, with people uh, to try to tell the stories better. Yeah. And in fact, that's something that CBC Indigenous has done recently was sending your journalist into community just to build relationships. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I got to I got to visit four communities along southern Quebec, and that was really just investing um, time to 
to get to know the communities that are that are there and, and what's important to them. And not just coming in, you know, with a camera crew and, you know, shoving a camera in their face right away, saying, we need the story right now. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, uh, like, the, the way a lot of media works isn't very, um, I guess, forgiving for the way uh, the relationship is with Indigenous people in, in terms of, uh, calling someone up and expecting them to be on a radio show in four hours or to be available right this instant to be on camera for, you know, tonight's newscast. Like, mm -hmm. it's not realistic. Um, for a lot, for a lot, I, from my experience, for a lot of um, communities, like, sometimes you have to, you might have to wait a few days before you can get that interview. Um, and that's what what Greg said, it's investing that time, not just to build those relationships, but to build, like, to build the relationships, but to build that trust. Um, and I think for journalists, like, what they really need to, <laughs> I really encourage every journalist to, to read the Reporting in Indigenous Communities Guide, um, because that, it lays out those, those reasons and those examples and, and tips on how to, to actually build that relationship. And that was a guide that was developed by Duncan McHugh, uh, Wabgijig Rice, and Megan Fiddler. Yep. Um, and that's something that all CBC journalists and storytellers have uh, access to, so um, that's a step one. How, we talk, how do we talk mainstream journalists into investing in communities and Indigenous story when there's no time? when we have deadlines, when we have 10 other stories to do, when we're not part of that community, when that community is not trusting and they don't want to let us in there, what, how do we do that? You just got to wait. <laughs> and you gotta, <laughs> like, there's no simple, quick response to do that. And I think that's what's frustrating. I mean, I'm a journalist too. I, sometimes I don't make my deadline because of that. But you just got to, you know, bite the bullet and relation, building relationships take time and that's it. That's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, you guys. <laughs> so what about the film industry? How do, we, how do we make change there? Yeah, well, you know, as I was saying before, what I would love to see is just having Indigenous actors included across the board, you know, and I think that starts... It starts at the very beginning, you know, in the idea, in the idea of, of for a series or a film, in the creation, uh, in the writer's room, which is like the writer's room is like once you have an idea for a series, um, then usually you get money for development, and then you go into a, a writer's room and you come up with the story, with the storyline. You really flesh it out and the characters and everything. And I think, you know, even at, the, at that point, that's when 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 content creators in, in Canada need to be thinking of this or you know and then it and then it goes to like it goes through a bunch of different levels so it's not only the the, the creators the writers room the producers involved the director the casting process like I, I think I mean it really is like a systemic thing like everybody needs to be thinking of this and 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 hopefully when it gets to the point where they're, where they're casting the roles, I mean, they just need to be more like open-minded about everything in general. I mean, all, it seems like so many other ethnicities, uh, eth people from different actors from different ethnic backgrounds have been really successful in being able to play just any, ca any character, like the doctor on that show or the cop on that show. But it, it's like indigenous people still haven't been given that time of day yet you know mm, and mm. I, I that's what I want to see and and I guess I'm just gonna have to go around and start like advocating for that all across the country to really get that into people's minds and to to let them know you know you got to stop just writing native characters in when it serves the purpose of your story you mm -hmm. know and I mean that can kind of be harmful too you, they, you know you see the so many times the native character the, the breakdown the description of the character it's like perpetuating this stereotype that were these like the spiritual like like they have you know <laughs> their name is like running fox and and they wear feathers all the time like it's just this sort of silly Hollywood stereotype yeah. that we need to stop perpetuating because when you do that, you're just contributing to the problem. You're, you're putting us back into this um, cycle where we're not advancing. We're not ever seeing Indigenous people in, 
in in a new light or in a modern light or uh, or as as real humans, you know, who mm, aren't just mm. about, you know, feathers and turquoise or like like we have feelings and we're people too <laughs> and and we want to be part of it and we are part of it. That's the thing. In everyday life, we're all walking amongst everybody and, and so that should be reflected in our in our tv and, and film industry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. michelle i heard you um mm -hmm. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can hear everything with that <laughs> um i don't remember there were a lot of things i was <clears throat> agreeing, agreeing with you about uh i just you know what would be really cool, I think, for, for story creation is to entertain the idea of collaborative storytelling, for one. And another thing is for you know, journalists and media makers to, who, who are not Indigenous to approach community members to say, hey, what stories do you want to get out there? What stories, what's going on in your community that you want to tell? And it's like, I say, this is, they're, they're sort of a little parallel movement, I suppose, working within academia, you know, where there are these, you know, research protocols, uh, working with Indigenous communities, sort of guidelines, and, and a lot of that is about, um, like, taking out, removing the ego, you know, I mean, we're in this time, we talk about... The in three show business? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> is it possible? Is it possible? Uh, hey, hey, hey. But, but I mean, in... <laughs> But I mean, in, in, again, with this truth and reconciliation kind of movement, or maybe that's not a resurgence. We can call it indigenous resurgence. Like we're at this really incredible time where um, I think I think you know, despite some of those challenges in Quebec, for instance, you know, those things are happening. Misrepresentation, cultural appropriation, really insensitive storytelling about indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. But we're not standing for that. You can if you're gonna do it, you're gonna get a. Uh, mm. Blank storm of response, you know, a and blank storm, <laughs> yeah, a beep storm of response, and and I think you know there's 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 so much dynamism and uh, you know going on like like we're not like, no way you can't get away with mm -mm. doing those mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. really um, so that in itself is a is a real shift a real change yes yeah yeah absolutely you know uh, we're here you know we're visible like we're mm -hmm. uh, articulate like we're we're not going to accept those negative stereotypes anymore and um you know, I mean, I mean, I think it, it is really important. Well, I, I agree with both of you that I think non-Indigenous people can tell Indigenous stories in a in a caring and respectful way, and it's and it's happening. Um, I, I think we we really need to really push that space for Indigenous stories. It's it's been too long, really, that you know the story and the narrative has been dominated by others. Um, you know, so I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, training, I think more programs, stuff to get young folks out there. Journey students, are you around? Yay! <laughs> um, to get, uh, you know, post-secondary programs, to get young people um, confident with the skills to be able to tell their own stories. How do we, though, you're talking a lot about stereotypes and, and pan-indigenousness and, you know, the turquoise and the feathers. I have a whole drawer full myself. No, I'm just kidding. I don't. Um, how do we rip down stereotypes if people don't know it's a stereotype? How do we change a system that's built that way? How do we change people. a system from inside? I think just asking Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. <gasps> what? Oh. Talk to us? That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, but it's, like, it's what Greg said earlier, talking to Indigenous people rather than at them mm -hmm. or about them. Indigenous people know their communities, they know their cultures. Like, and no, that was, it, It's <laughs> true, but at the same time, it, it can get really exhausting to yeah. always have to be answering questions and educating people as you go along in life. Like, as individuals, I'm sure we've all done it where you know, you're somewhere and it comes up and then someone says something super ignorant and then you have to take the moment to teach them something and, and, and that's great and fine and usually they're, they're super receptive and grateful for you to share that with them. But at the same time, it can be really hard and exhausting and, yeah. and it can be a, a bit of a burden at times because, you know, it's like it shouldn't just be on us. Like I think... The, the bigger issue is probably our education system. Like that's probably where 
people should be getting this kind of information, you know, and we're glad to help and supplement that, but it shouldn't be on us as individuals to always be teaching you something, you know? Mm -hmm. It should be coming from the education system and then that should, that should give people a better understanding of indigenous people in this country. But who's I mean, building it's, it's the education not, system you know, so really? Like that's where it needs to start. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I, th I mean, I think that's probably the key to a lot of the issues in this country with regard to indigenous people is probably our education system. Mm -hmm. So Brittany, why, why is it important that we have better indigenous representation in film and media in all of these, these venues and, and places? Well, I mean, it's important for, not just for indigenous people, for every ethnic group in this country. Um, it's important because it says you matter. When you see yourself reflected on screen in the mainstream media, whether it's um, you know, TV, film, um, radio, music, journalism, like when, when you see yourself reflected, it just means that you matter too. And when you don't see yourself reflected, it, it's not a nice feeling. And, and, it, and it makes you feel like you don't matter. And for a long time, I mean, growing up, I, I'm sure there are other indigenous people who felt this way, but even as a kid, I remember feel, for a long time, feeling like I didn't matter or like I was less than, or I was always conscious or self-conscious when I would tell people, that I'm Mohawk, like it was always like, oh God, they're gonna, what are they gonna think of me? It was mm. like this, I mean, it took a long time and a lot of work for me to get over that. And I think we're in a much better place where I hope that our youth doesn't have to feel like that. But I know for a long time I did. And I thought, I just thought, why would anyone hire me? Or why, why I can't do that because I'm, you know, it was mm. just this really, so representation will hopefully make all those kids not feel like that. Will make them feel like they belong, they matter too, they have a say, they have a voice, and that they are wanted. Mm. Jessica, why is it important as somebody who works at the CBC in a mainstream organization to tell those stories properly to represent indigenous people in those newsrooms? Well, I think Brittany just said it perfectly. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that applies not just to, um, you know, film and television and c the creative aspect, but for news storytelling, it's ex exactly the same. Um, when you don't see yourselves in the news or when you're seeing yourselves misrepresented mm. or when you're seeing yourself um, in a way that's always that tragedy and that, that controversy, controversy and you're not seeing those amazing stories that you know exist in your community that, that can, I think can have a damaging impact on, yeah. mm -hmm. on, on people's lives. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on this side of the room on that? Yeah, I mean, and just to echo what they both have said, um, it's also important that, we're, that when we're telling our stories um, that the non-Indigenous people are, are, are hearing these stories and seeing us as as people, as humans, that we're not just the, the, the typical stereotype and we're not just mascots and, uh, you know, because those are some of the things that, that most native, most non-native people see about native people is, 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 is yeah, it's a Halloween <laughs> costume or a sports mas mascot and, mm -hmm. and we're so much more than that and, and that's one of the reasons why uh, there's such this, such a big movement against cultural appropriation and against sports teams, sports team mascots. You know, so in order to, to, you know, because sports team mascots, they're, 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 what, they're usually mythical creatures, uh, animals, and whatever. Uh, and, then, and then if you put an indigenous person as a mascot, it's showing the world that, that you're on the same level as, as animals and, uh, and mythical creatures, and, and, and that's not the case. And so we need to be in charge of, of the narrative and telling our stories and, and getting out there um, what all the, all the good things that are, that are mm, happening in mm, our communities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's part of st storytelling and accurate storytelling uh, in media, in, in journalism, and, and in the, the film and TV industry. Michelle? Mm -hmm. Totally agree.
<laughs> totally agree. Ditto. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Check, check. Yeah, you know, it's funny, like, as a Métis person, so much of media representation, the headlines, just there's always this thing about the sort of untrustworthy Métis, you know, where it's like, what are they up to now? Who really belongs? Who really are you? And it's funny, I feel like those, that, that, sent, that hasn't changed at all in it's still the same thing. It's so crazy. You know, I mean, I was, uh, anyway, quite a few years ago, I did some, I was looking at these old silent films, you know, and the half, the half breed was always the one like lurking in the bushes, like waiting to pounce <laughs> on someone. Seriously, you know, and had some kind of brown makeup on their face. And it's just that sort of that idea yeah. about, oh, what are they doing? Oh, they can't be dressed. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. you know, they're a little bit of this. They're a little bit of that. You know, we can't dress them. And I mm. still see that. And that <laughs> bugs me. I'm old enough to not be bothered by that stuff, but it bugs me. It bugs me and it forms my day-to-day -day interactions, you know? When people mm. are like, oh, well, what are you anyway? Mm. You don't, you don't mm. look like anything, what? You know? Yeah. So oh, yeah, it, that's, it has an impact, you know? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that's the other thing is it's like, we're on a spectrum of colors these days, indigenous people, you know? We can look like me, we can look like Jessica, we can look like Rosanna, we, we can look like, we can all, we all look, different we and like people need to understand that and I think that's another part of of I would say like casting choices you know when it comes to indigenous roles I mean I the only time I've ever been cast as an indigenous person I've been cast three times as an indigenous person and all three times were by female Mohawk filmmakers mm. because they get it, you know what I mean? Mm. And, and uh, so that's another challenge for me as an actor, but I think in the industry itself, um, you know, we wanna see ourselves, but we wanna see ourselves portrayed accurately. Uh, we wanna see ourselves portrayed as real, uh, three-dimensional. Um, we wanna be reflected as we are in real life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to get some questions here from some audience members. Who do we got up first? Come on down. <laughs> You're next on Turtle Island Reads. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question. Anybody stick your hand up? thought there was a couple in there. Right here. Wow. Well, don't you want to put your hands up at once now. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, I, I've been thinking about so many things here. I agree that uh, education as a teacher, of course, is an important place uh, to address all of this. I also think, uh, as noted, you know, if 10 million people watched the intro to North of 60, or the, the pilot of North of 60, of course, um, this is where people get so many depictions is in these film representations, even more, I think, than the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've recently, again, rewatched Real Engine, um, and I think about Jesse Wente and his optimism at the end about indigenous control of depictions in the media, mm -hmm. um, and how right after it came out, he lamented that interview because then what he calls Dances with Blue Wolves came out, Avatar, and he said this set us back 30 years. And I'm curious um, what you think about, uh, have we been set back by that? Can we ignore the mainstream and these kind of depictions that do that? Um, are we are we only ten years back from retrieving that, or have we moved beyond that? Where are we? Where are we now in light of what uh, what Jesse Wenty once called "real engine post Avatar"? <laughs> <laughs> Let's tackle that first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah, crickets. Have um, we moved? I guess is the question. Yeah, from where I, I we don't were know. That's a good. Wolves? That's a really great. Yeah. Point. I mean, well, Dances with Wolves and Avatar were kind of pretty far apart, at least 12 years apart. I don't know. I'm just guessing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember when Avatar came out and it was all the rage and the highest grossing film of all time broke the record. And, you know, all the all the indigenous people went to, who went to see it, we were like, whoa, that's that's us. That's the story of like what happened here. And nobody else thought that that was the case. I mean, I think even James Cameron himself yeah. said like, what? No, that's not what it was about. And it was just kind of funny because it was so obvious to us <laughs> and so not obvious to everyone else. Um, so yes, I think that was probably a really major boo-boo. But I will say in Canada, I think we are, there's still work to do, but I think we are much farther ahead than Hollywood. So when, when everything I've kind of said 
today is in reference to the Canadian film industry um, with regard to, uh, you know, the, the U.S. industry, which is basically the whole rest of the world, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think there's still so much more work to do there. Um, you know, Indigenous representation is like not even a thought, I think, on their mind when it, when it comes to when it comes to their films and TV. They're still, cast, they're still writing in native characters though and, and still just there to like, because it serves a purpose for this one particular storyline or, or whatnot. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I can't really speak to it more than that. <laughs> it was basically Pocahontas in space, right? <laughs> Am I right? Basically. Anybody else want to? Or what dances with Smurfs? <laughs> that one too. La, yeah. la, la, yeah. la, la. <laughs> <laughs> Did anybody else want to tackle that? I, Mich Thoughts? Michelle, you kind of talked, uh, touched on this earlier about um, you know people not getting away with it, and mm -hmm. Indigenous mm -hmm. people speaking out. Mm -hmm. And I, f I feel like my role as a journalist is to to listen to that and to to write those stories when Indigenous people aren't aren't happy with with certain representations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's, I mean, it, it's, it's changing, it's changing, and it's going to change big time. It just, it just cannot, it's not going to go back to dances with wolves and dances with Smurfs. I mean, there will always be those big Hollywood blockbusters that get it wrong, mm -hmm. and it's going to continue they to happen. Care. And, you know, but it, it, that's, I don't, that's, yeah. well, it matters, but, but it just, that we, we can't go back, and, and I think there's such great stuff happening, and, uh, you know, it, more and more indigenous voices in media and in film. And it's not just about the fact of having more voices, but really talented people, like amazing stuff. Like I think a lot happening in art and media these days by indigenous creators. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the most uh, you know, avant-garde, out there, risk-taking, genre-bending uh, work that, uh, that, that I've seen. It's, it's, yeah. I was hoping to get a Facebook uh, question here, but my technology has failed. Amanda, did you have a... This is from Leela. Leslie. Leslie Kayla. Oh, ooh, that's a, it's a mouthful. How do we uh, combat colonialism and uh, letting go of that... Uh, that shame that so many Indigenous people learn to carry in their bones mm -hmm. from harmful stereotypes, from right. harmful media coverage, from being left out of the story, from being forced to build your own media empire, as it were. <laughs> How do we move on as Indigenous people in this conversation, do you think? I think by telling our own stories. Because um, how, how else are we going to move past anything uh, if we're not the ones telling the stories that, that matter. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the only way I think for, for, for us, I think to, to or for the, the media to get things right is um, having the space for indigenous storytellers to tell their stories. Um, and then those stories then become out there, and then hopefully the rest of the world uh, starts to see these stories and seeing the value of these stories and, and, and allowing the space for these stories to continue to be told. Mm. Anybody else? Jessica? It's a tough question. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, right, telling our own stories, and it's great what Greg is doing, and in Kahnawake, but also like infiltrating mainstream <laughs> media space <laughs> and doing it that way too. Like I did the infiltrate <laughs> <laughs> and expand. <Yeah. laughs> I think it's also a lot of personal and individual work as mm -hmm. well. It's working on yourself. It's, it's, it's figuring out who you are, not only in terms of your, your, your culture, you know, um, like who you are as, a, as an indigenous person, like whatever your nation is, you know, like for me, it's like, okay, who am I? But also, who are you in terms of life? Like, what do you want to do with your life? What do you want out of life? What are your goals? I think knowing that and figuring out, I mean, it takes time. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. 
either as, as, as a group or as an individual, but it's, it's like starting today to, to work on yourself. You have a to, lot of trauma. To, to... Yes, heal the trauma, whether, whether it's going to therapy, whether it's, you know, going to a healing lodge, whether it's whatever way, I think it's, it's healing is, is, is the, the solution. And I think it's up to every individual to take that upon themselves and heal that, heal your soul, heal, you know, heal whatever needs to be healed, whatever wounds, open wounds you have. Um, it's our, our own individual responsibility. You know, take care of yourself first and the rest will, will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michelle, did you have a thought on that? Um, we had Ryan McMahon in our class earlier with Hey Journey students. He was pretty right on, hey? Silence. <laughs> They're out there somewhere. <laughs> They're out there somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, he, he talked about, you know, all of us as Indigenous peoples having a story. We all have a story. We all come from a culture and a history, and we all have something really strong and rich that we come from. And even if you know we're not quite ready to put it out there yet, it's it's in us. Like you can't like, whether you, it's it's just there. Mm. Um, and I think the more that we can make space for Indigenous stories, the more you know there is sort of safety to share those stories and, and share who we are. Um, I, 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 again, I, I think it's going to happen, but but it's it's like a personal level, it's a community level, right. but definitely seeing you know images and you know the great stuff that's going on, you know the athletes who are going to the Olympics and the you know the people who are uh, who are out there. The more we see that, the more there are role models for young people. Like it, you know, I, I wish it could just change just like that. I wish it could, but mm. it took us one hundred years to get here. Well, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, a little. It's a process. Time, it's a process. Is there any other questions from our audience? Yeah, we have one over here. Uh, excellent. So I'm also an educator here, but I, I'm also a parent of a of a child in elementary school and another one in high school. And um, we talk about representation in the in the media, but uh, and and I agree with everything I've heard today in, in, in the panel. But it's also the representation in textbooks in the classroom. I'm horrified oh my by what my kids are subjected to in terms of the textbooks that they have, and I really try very hard. And I feel like my kids are lucky because I'm at least sensitive to this issue and talk to them about this colonialist version of history, and uh, which is extremely problematic. Mm. And um, I recently went to the play Children of God, which mm. was so incredibly amazing. And one of the things after in the Q&A, they were talking about, you know, how many Indigenous authors in this country have you read? How many, you know, um, Indigenous films have you seen? And it, and it made me realize not enough, you know. Mm. So I, I went out to go, you know, searching. And uh, I'm just wondering, you know, here you've got an audience uh, you know, what can we do to make them, because I think it starts at that level. Mm. You know, it was in that um, elementary school where the, where the teachers wore the headdress, you know, um, probably not even really understanding that they were doing something wrong. And uh, how, what can we do as, as people, as a community to say, rewrite the textbooks, let's start there. Let's start the conversation in kindergarten when there are kids enter school. That's where I see the change starting to happen. What do you think about that? Can I jump in? Of course. Write to your school boards, write to your school administration. It's, it, my son is in sec two, not bad. I hear sec three is a doozy. It's real bad, <laughs> it's real bad. You know, one of my nieces is constantly in challenges with her teacher because she says, oh, but it, it was bad, the whole colonial time. It was bad, the, the whole contact and colonization. And the teacher's like, no, no, it was okay. You know, <laughs> I mean, see, I'm serious. Yeah, I'm for you. serious. <laughs> it is unbelievable. And it makes me feel sometimes like, like what, really? What? It, it, it doesn't make sense. So we have to make noise. We have to. I mean, there was a shift in the Quebec curriculum, in the history curriculum. It was criticized, but it, it wasn't changed. We have to be loud about that. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like young people, like you guys, you know. Like, you know what's okay and what's not okay. And I find that young people can, you, like, you get it, you know? 
don't listen to us old folks, only some of us. But, uh, but you get, like, and, and I think that we need to, we need to, uh, we need to speak out. Like, really, it's, it's, uh, it's going to come from us. It's never, it's not going to happen from above this change. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're just out of time, and unless anybody has quick thoughts they want to... I had one little quick thought to add to that about Ed. something you can do as well, in addition to what Michelle said. Visit the, the indigenous communities, you know, like Gunawage is the closest one to here. Um, there's also Gunasadage, which isn't far either, near next to Oka. Like, you know, we have resources there. We have a, a cultural center. It's kind of small right now, but it does have a beautiful exhibit in there. We're working on getting a bigger... Um, Museum building and everything that would be that would be a, a great step in, in in the right direction for everybody. But reach out to the communities and and find out what what can you do to to you know they they ex, they take students in all the time for field trips and they come and visit the community and see what it's like and meet meet some indigenous people. You know, I had a colleague last year who she said she never met an indigenous person in her life. And I was like, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I don't well, know. You probably did. You just didn't know. <laughs> I don't know. But it's just, it's about that too. It's about meeting each other and building bridges and making friends. And, and it's, it's that personal level too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Thank you all. Uh, we've run out of time for questions uh, for this discussion. Um, I'm Rosanna Deirdre, host of Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Thanks to, our, uh, to you and to our audience online for tuning in today. I want to thank our four panelists, Michelle Smith, uh, Dawson Professor in Cinema Communications, filmmaker, coordinator of Dawson College Transition Program for Indigenous Students, Journeys, they're out there somewhere. <laughs> uh, Greg Horn, an Indigenous storyteller and editor uh, from Ghanawage. Um, Brittany Laborn, an actor, writer, and production coordinator at Resolution Pictures. And Jessica Deer, a Montreal-based reporter, editor at CBC Indigenous. I also want to thank uh, John Abbott College, its Media Arts Department, and Indigenous Studies Certificate, including Director Derek Maisonville. Uh, <laughs> you can go back and hear tonight's discussion on CBC Montreal's Facebook page if uh, you want to share that around. That'd be awesome. And for the people here with me in this room, uh, stick around. Uh, in one hour, we'll be back here on this stage for Turtle Island Reads Book Club, um, which is coming up at 6.30. So thank you so very much. Thank you.